Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 4, Episode 19, titled Blood and Roses. We are so, so close to Sunny Amnesia. So close. I can see it. He's just got to blow up first, and then we're going to get there. I can see the explosion on the horizon. (laughs) It originally premiered on April 1st, 1988. It is written by Dick Wolf. Surprise, surprise. He wrote every episode this season and then or put his name on every episode somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and it is directed by sorry, let me make sure I get this name right. George Mendeluk. And he's got one more episode coming this season. So and that's that'll be it for him. So we have a rookie vice director for this episode. And it seems like maybe he should have watched the series a little bit. You know, maybe started at <laughs> season one. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Worked his way through. I feel like maybe the storyline has been done before. Well, shouldn't Dick Wolf have known that? He's been on since the beginning, he right? He doesn't put his name on it. <laughs> well, he didn't I'm actually looking, read. We're kind of hinting around and we'll talk. Definitely more about it. That this episode is a lot like season one, episode ten, titled "Give a Little, Take a Little." And I'm looking back at the writers and directors, so we have no crossover here. So, so they really just ha- they really just don't know. <laughs> just not that creative. I guess. <laughs> just not aware. Before, before we've seen Gina's like, I swear I've done this before. <laughs> Before we get started, I can check in, see what's each other's lives. Guys, there's a big movie announcement. Or not say an announcement. Like, we knew this movie was coming. It was already talked about that it was going to happen. But we got the title and some teasers and stills, in, yes. in stills of what the movie was going to be. And for those fans of Wonder Woman, you'll be excited to know that it's Wonder Woman 84 right in our wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's got to be a vice multiple vice <laughs> mentions inside of this movie, right? Yeah, exactly. There's got to be a Don Johnson lookalike in this movie. <laughs> Surprise, surprise, as we all found out that Chris Pine is going to be in this movie. So maybe Chris Pine will be Don Johnson. I don't know. Maybe he'll rock the white suit. And what I've I've recently seen is that DJ wears regular tennis shoes. And Tubbs wears his nice wingtips, but DJ wears tennis shoes while he's walking around. Well, hey, that's just smart, okay? He's got to run sometimes. (laughs) He can't help it if Tubbs isn't caught on to that. (laughs) Goes so well with the suit. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, eighty four. They they released some stills. It's a very eighties look to it, and also there's some side by side comparisons of the eighties comics that the storyline is going to be based on. So there's a lot of in the stills, it like straight shots from the comic book. So nerds unite, everyone be <laughs> happy about nerds. Huh? <laughs> everyone be happy about that. Speaking on behalf of that, uh, I think it's. <laughs> Awful cool that they are doing these as as time pieces, which I mean, I think kind of fits the storyline for Wonder Woman as far as the comics, because I feel like each generation kind of had its own iteration of Wonder Woman, you know, like they would update her about once a decade. So I was surprised they immediately jumped to 84 from World War Two. Like I thought we would stop in the 60s first, but thankfully they did jump to the 80s or else we wouldn't be able to talk about it. I think the reasoning behind that might be either A, uh, the 80s are popular right now, so they want to do a storyline in the 80s because of like Stranger Things and stuff like that. Or B, they w- they're trying to leapfrog as fast as they can to modern times because she's so popular so they just like let's go forward 50 years (laughs) yeah we don't got time to wait around (laughs) Uh (laughs) well speaking of things that we have seen before as in the 80s and wonder woman let's go talk about this episode of miami vice that we've seen before but last time it was with burt young and this time we get a new character but a returning one so i'm happy (laughs) to see stanley tucci again (laughs) (laughs) let's go talk about this week's episode So before we really get started, I just want to make a mention of the last time we saw Frank Mosca. So this is a continuation of the Frank Mosca storyline. We originally saw him in Season 4, Episode 1, titled Contempt of Court. I just want to go back in time. What we we talked about in that episode. First, Frank Mosca likes to burn money. Also pass chocolates around the courthouse and order pizzas while he's on trial. So he's not afraid of the big bad justice system in his special cell in his own bed and his unlimited visitors. He's allowed to kind of do whatever he wants to. And court makes him hungry. <laughs> he's also a huge douchebag. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> uh, Switek failed the monitoring test again where he's too busy getting hot dogs. Well, he did monitor those hot dogs, though. <laughs> 
<laughs> he had a good eye on that hot dog. It did not go anywhere. We had to continually check on the tub scoreboard for how many times they let him speak. <laughs> Turns out it was only like 10 in that episode. <laughs> Crockett went to jail to protect his witnesses. Didn't help, though. He's still His witness still got murdered inside right in the jail. Right in front of him. He watched it happen, actually. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then, of course, Frank Mosca gets off. Jack's kid, Son- Sonny's friend, tries to kill him out in front of the courthouse, but Sonny talks him down. So just saying, like, none of this would have been what have happened if they were. They should have just, just let it finish out that way. <laughs> <laughs> so now here we are. We're up to current time. We're at a party house with hookers as valet, which is it, it's actually a great service. <laughs> like, way to go. <laughs> uh-huh. I also feel like we have started most of the season on the stakeout or the stakeout or the sting. Like every episode that started kind of with a stakeout sting. And that's kind of where we are. They're actually finishing one. They're either finishing one court case or starting a new one. Luckily, we don't have to do any other backstory stuff. We'll just get right to it. Like you said before, John, get that pesky plot out of the way. <laughs> Let's just get <laughs> yeah, to making this show. It's a party that Gina's working with some greaseball, as I know him then, but he's we're going to find out later that his name is Cook, and he's getting really touchy. He's all over Gina, and then Frank Mosca comes walking over, and she is hiding her surprise, but very surprised to see Frank because they haven't seen him since he got off of his trial. He just disappeared. Turns out Cook is the one that was throwing the party, but Mosca squeezes his way right in there like, oh, hey, Gina, what's Who going on? Where are you hey. from? South Philly? Oh, hey. I hear they like onions out there. It's got some work for it. <laughs> so Mosca is working his angle really strong. He is grabbing her arm. He's kissing her hand. He's getting up in her face. like, And Cook's just watching the whole time like, yeah, what is going on? Hey, wait, but this is my party. <laughs> uh-huh. He didn't try very hard, though. <laughs> he didn't. And after he was done flirting with Gina and he walks away, Cook seems super nervous. Like, like he's like shaking, having trouble lighting his cigarette. Cook says that he's involved with some complicated, legitimate business with Mosca. And he's very nervous and afraid of how that conversation went. But Gina's like, Oh, that Frank Mosca guy. And it's like, come on, Gina. Come on. Yeah, I know. Don't you know who he is? <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits. So before we get started really getting deep into this episode, let's take a look at the, this week's guest stars because we have a couple that we've seen before because this is a continuation of the Frank Mosca storyline. Oh, yeah. So firstly, you pointed out Stanley Tucci playing Frank Mosca also appeared as Frank Mosca in Contempt of Court. But did you know he also appeared as Stephen DeMarco in Baby Blues? Yep, the one that won't talk about where the babies are coming from. He says he will, but then he backs out and says he won't. Yep. I think we've already kind of talked about Stanley Tucci multiple times. You might know him from the Pelican Brief, Road to Perdition, Lucky Number 11. But let's move on to people who... Our new device, we have Michael Wincott, who plays Willie Cook. And... He's a Canadian actor uh, known for his deep, raspy voice, which I didn't get from Cook in this episode. But, I mean, he's only in part of the episode, so. <laughs> yeah, the short part. <laughs> he did some other TV, some of it vice-related, as in he did Crime Story. He also did Equal- Equalizer. And his actually his first appearance was in 1979, where he starred in a Canadian film called Wild Horse Hank with Linda Blair. Michael Wincock, the most his most prominent roles, the ones you might know him from, he played one of the sheriff's goons in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. He played the uh, main antagonist, Top Dollar, in the movie The Crow. Mm, I didn't realize that was him. He played he played music mogul Fi- uh, Philo Grant in Strange Days. He also played mercenary Frank Elgin in Alien Resurrection, my <laughs> favorite role. <laughs> <laughs> On a side note, his brother was Jeff Wincott, who starred in the late 80s TV series Night Heat, which that doesn't sound real. <laughs> no. no, I'm like, I've never heard of that. <laughs> Is it like Night Rider so, and another show like put together? Mixed together? The heat of the Night and Night Rider. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a racist car that Night Rider around. but with a boat we call it Night Heat <laughs> exactly <laughs> so he was also in some other bigger name movies like Born, in, uh, Born on the 4th of July 
and uh, I believe he was a psychopath killer and along came a spider. So our next guest is Meg Foster, who plays Allison Carson, uh, our U.S. attorney. She was yes. also in Contempt of Court. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I was so, actually surprised. I thought they would use her more in this episode when I saw her name on there, but she's, she's barely just a in one, it. Like a yeah. one appearance, right? One like, appearance. Just a couple. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So and we talked about her a little bit in contempt of court. So I mean, you know, she um she began her career on PBS's Net Playhouse, and, and then she made uh, appearances in a bunch of similar shows, being ba- Bonanza, Mod Squad, Barnaby Jones, Hawaii Five O. She also was Cagney, the first six episodes of Cagney and Lacey, before being replaced by Sharon Glass. <laughs> Wow, who knew that? You guys should know that. Didn't you guys watch Cagney and Lacey? Come on now. I'm more of a Simon and Simon. (laughs) That's what you guys watch, not your parents. It's just, it's never a sign when you're replaced after six episodes. Like the first six episodes. It's not, no. It's not really. And then that show went on to have like a great run. Yeah, just not with you on it. (laughs) TV show she's appeared in. She was in Quantum Leap, Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Sliders, and most recently, Xena Warrior Princess. Mm. She was in a bunch of movies, but I will sum up by naming the two best movies that she was in because all the other ones were kind of crap. (laughs) (laughs) She was in Masters of the Universe. Yes. And they man. live. <gasps> yeah, she's in yeah, two she, of my favorite movies. Yeah, that's right. She is in Masters of the Universe. She's like the evil. Isn't she the evil lady in Masters of the Universe, I think? I think so. Yes. So outside of Masters in the Universe and they live, like nothing else on that list even matters. Hey, all that matters is that she did work with Rowdy Roddy Piper. That's all I care about. And Dolph Lundgren. Yes. All in one. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, we also have Paul Herman, who plays Jimmy Roth. He was in Once Upon a Time in Mexico, At Close Range, The Color of Money, Big, Cadillac, Man, Heat. He was also in five episodes of The Sopranos and six episodes of Entourage. So he's had a pretty good career. Hmm. I wonder what he thinks of the former actor or who played E on Entourage. He's the one that directed that movie, Gaudy. But she's glad he's not part of that. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, uh, lastly, have Frank Stallone playing Billy. Frank Stallone, Sylvester's younger brother, pretty much just hung on to his brother's fame for most of his career. <laughs> so Frank is younger son of Jacqueline Stallone. Jacqueline was an astrologer, a former dancer, and a promoter of women's pro wrestling. Nice. And his dad, Frank Sr., who was a barber. Nice. Okay, so the mom is the one that was hustling. Yeah. She was getting shit done. Uh-huh. And then the uh-huh. dad was just making sure they looked good before they went out the house. Have you guys ever seen the mom? No. <laughs> I mean, she looks, really? like, she looks like Stallone as a woman. Uh, Frank Stallone has spent much of the 80s writing music for his brother's movies. He wrote his biggest hit is the song Far From Over from 1983, Staying Alive. That actually landed number 10 on the Hot 100. Damn, he actually made it on the Hot um, 100? Damn. Staying Alive was a, yeah. was a huge movie. Actually charted. Other soundtracks that he did, Over the Top and Rambo First Blood. Oh my god, he did Over the Top? <laughs> <laughs> he also played in a couple bit roles in his brother's movies. He was Carl in Staying Alive. He was also Caesar Mario in Hudson Hawk. Let's look. Okay, who is Frank Stallone away from his brother? Well, he uh, played himself on a short-lived sitcom called Movie Stars. Alongside Don Swayze and Joey Travolta. Okay, wait, no. No. No, I need to know where that is. Someone yes. needs to find that and I need to watch that. I want to see that right now. Don Swayze <laughs> and that famous guy, Joey Travolta. <laughs> Good old Don Sweetie. <laughs> Willis is ready to drop the headphones I'm right say, now. I'm done. I gotta go find this. <laughs> he was also a contestant on Hulk Hogan's Celebrity Championship Wrestling, which was a reality <laughs> competition that followed 10 celebrities as 
He trained and tried to to become uh, wrestlers. It was on guess what channel? Fox. Oh, um, not quite close. DMT. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. That would be my next guess. He also had a bit part in the movie Frank Claus. <laughs> it's better. Here's something. He voiced Thunderhoof on Transformers, the animated, the new animated cartoon from 2014 to 2017. Oh, I actually know who that is. Okay. <laughs> that one I do know. For my Transformer knowledge comes in handy, apparently. <laughs> and he also played Frank Bishop on Walker, Texas Granger. <laughs> From 99 to 2001. Wow. Melissa's so. got her phone out. She's looking for Don Swayze. <laughs> I, did you know that? <laughs> I'm like, is that real? Is there really a Don Swayze? <laughs> there's a Don Swayze. And there's, I looked at the IMBD because I wanted to see Don Swayze and I wanted to see Joey Travolta. I, so, yeah, yeah. Hold on. it's a real I, show. Hold I know on. who Don Swayze is. I've seen him in other stuff. I didn't know that he was really related. Why are all the famous actors who have like a sibling that also acts? Why does the sibling look like the evil version of them? <laughs> <laughs> he looks like I know, I know, he looks right? Like the generic like dinosaur version of Patrick. <laughs> Bet you you can't even dance. <laughs> Okay, so when we come back from the opening credits, Gina's reviewing with Dad, the host, Cook. Is he making his money from making... Sorry. <laughs> Drop my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Cook isn't making his money from making pasta. Okay, the pasta <laughs> fagioli isn't making him money. That made me laugh, the pasta factory. <laughs> the pasta market is down. Pasta's <laughs> not in demand right now. Maybe if Frank was going court. Or he'd order more pasta. <laughs> but she can't get any information out of Cook unless she wants to sleep with them, which she says she'd rather chew glass than do that. So <laughs> the Cook route is going nowhere. But she does say she saw Frank Mosca. And as the duo walk in, See, everyone is very confused that Frank is back. I'm, I'm feeling a little bad for Cook, man. I mean, she'd rather chew glass. Like, hey, turns out he's not, not such a terrible guy, you know? I mean, he doesn't last much longer, but... Um. Well, I mean, <laughs> he's not quite the looker. <laughs> not that Frank Mosca <laughs> is either, but... <laughs> but aside from that, this is where we first start to get attitude from Sonny. I mean, he basically gives Gina the, I'll take it from here, toots. Speech. Yes, he does. Yeah, he, he, without saying it, says you're not a real cop. Let a real cop handle this. Which I was confused as to what he was going to do. He's like, I have a plan. Well, he knows you're a cop. So what's your plan? Your, your cover's blown, Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's gone. He knows you're a no, cop. No, no. See, he knows Sonny Crockett is a cop. He doesn't know that Sonny <laughs> Burnett is a cop. <laughs> Dad says, Gina, continue what it is that you're doing. Go cultivate a relationship with Frank Mosca, Tubbs, and Crockett. You guys go pressure cook. So they go off over to Dixie Lily. That's the name of the pasta company. What's it called? The Spaghetti Factory from now on. Yeah, that's what we should call it. <laughs> At the Spaghetti Factory, Frank is meeting with Cook, and Cook is in over his head. He's saying, I was changing money launderers from my previous person, which is Roth, to Mosca, but Roth said he'll kill me, so I'm having troubles moving it. And Frank says, I don't care. I really don't care. All I know is that you haven't paid me yet. I've been laundering money for you, but you haven't paid me yet. I'm taking keys to the factory until you finally pay me, which I want by the end of the day tomorrow. Which makes sense. Frank likes pasta. He likes food. We've established that. So <laughs> taking the pasta factory is going to save him money in the long run. <laughs> Over at the precinct, Sonny is explaining to Gina the ins and outs, the subtle ins and outs of being a police officer, as if she doesn't know already. He's like, look, you got to be careful of this, and you got to do that. And Gina's like, I can handle Frank. I'm not stupid. Your friend was the one that was stupid. They got killed by Frank. I can handle him. Get off my back. Ooh. Oh, Gina. <laughs> Talk to th that way at the end of the episode. Let us know how you feel at the end of this episode, uh -huh. whether or not you could handle it. <laughs> I know. I was so on Gina's side until everything kind of went downhill. Yeah, that's what I told Dominic. That's the most irritating part about this whole episode is that from the beginning, Crockett's like, this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And it ends up all being true. What he basically said, it happens. So it's like, God, they, they doubted yeah. her. And then she went and did the same thing. So she doubted her about. <laughs> uh-huh. So now we get the phone call between Gina and Frank. And, and at 
phone call is basically them flirting about him wanting her to decorate decorate me a bed so I can do you. You know, it's basically the tone of the conversation. <laughs> it, it's the end of the conversation that gets me. He basically says, you know, hey, whatever you want, food. And, and Gina wants red wine and manicotti. I mean, I guess manicotti underrated pasta, but I'm not going manicotti if I have a choice of <laughs> any kind of pasta. It has a pasta factory. You can go anywhere. Um <laughs> I, I, I'm probably going you tortellini. Can ziti, you can get rotini, spaghetti, fettuccine. I mean, like the noodle possibilities are endless here. You can even get the giant shells if you wanted. You go ravioli. You can get it. <laughs> just saying. Uh, yes, exact, I, I just feel manicotti is just lazy. I don't know. I, I, I'm going tortellini. <laughs> I'm going something with some, some curl to it. <laughs> The only thing I would say to you is, if, if I'm Frank, I'd be I'm nervous about going on a date with a woman that wants something that's so filling. <laughs> she can't move after she eats it. It really comes off like she's she's not there for the whole night. She's there just for dinner. <laughs> she's leaving. Cause you can't you can't eat a manicotti and get busy later. It's not happening. No, there's no way you're gonna get the motion sickness alone. Like <laughs> exactly. you're just so full and it's all heavy because it's just cheese, like ricotta cheese. And, uh, and yeah, that's a, it, it's like, a cheese, rich cheese. It's the type of food you eat on Thanksgiving. That way you can take a nap <laughs> in the afternoon. <laughs> Out at the spaghetti factory, the door are there and Tubbs and Crockett are touching like all of the pasta. I know. That's not sanitary. <laughs> <laughs> Sunny tells Do us they that even have a warrant to be here? No, they don't. They that, do not. That is asked later. <laughs> yes, because Cook asks him about that. It's like, do you have a warrant? He says, no, but we will pressure you until you came, essentially, because we know you're involved with Frank Mosca. So if we go investigate Frank, what do you think Frank is going to do to you? So then they do something weird. They say, we're going to be back for the, all of the records tomorrow afternoon. And then they just leave him alone and like, don't surveil him or anything yeah i'm just sure you know. they could get a court order to say that they can at least watch him and wiretap him oh they don't follow that stuff anyway they could just watch him and then say <laughs> they weren't watching him <laughs> i think it's funny they're just like trustworthy like well we'll see you tomorrow pal you know like, <laughs> don't leave town or anything but okay <laughs> yeah don't leave i'm sure frank won't be bothered that cops came to see you today and if Frank's Gina's there for a little wine and having some dinner, Frank's like Art Deco, Art Schmecko. Oh my God. Eyes lock, and they know they're having a moment over the Schmecko. <laughs> 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 she's explaining how she's going to do a Jersey Girl themed <laughs> decoration. I do appreciate that. In the very beginning of this, when Gina's with Frank, is that she's showing that she's really drunk at this one, too. That she's having a hard time controlling herself around him. Because you see in this, she is a little wine drunk yes. in this. And she's letting it mm -hmm. fly a little bit more than what she should be doing as a police officer. And so I think we're getting a signal early, like, Gina can't really control herself around him. And she she leaves this one after they talk and... He, they talk about the decoration and stuff, and uh, Mosca asks, asks her about Cook, and she says, oh, that's an, he, he's a nobody. And Mosca says, good, because I don't like to share. Asks her to, uh, he kind of asks her to go steady with him. Yeah, that's exactly what he asks. He's like, hey, are you dating anyone? Because I want to date you. Yeah, and I don't share. <laughs> yeah. Would you wear my Letterman jacket? <laughs> Would you wear my spaghetti factory jacket? <laughs> It's got the emblem on the back. It's just a spaghetti noodle, but you know. The next day at the you think she took some of that manicotti home. <laughs> you know she did. She got a couple boxes for later. <laughs> he owns the factory. You can give her as much as he wants. <laughs> I, I, I care less about the date. I'm only concerned about the pasta. What's going on with the pasta here? We have to know how Creamy much red, regular red. Yeah, and what's going on? Spicy, like what was it? <laughs> <laughs> the next day at the precinct, Gina comes in and suddenly asks how her date was with Frank. He's so nosy. And the <laughs> whole precinct is like, "You dumb!" Even Tubbs, Tubbs was cross that. I'm like, "You stupid mother!" Did you, oh, did you have a good date? All sarcastic. Of course, Gina doesn't handle that well. She comes over and says, "I'm a cop. I'm an undercover cop. Why you gotta be so condescending to me?" And we're like, "Yeah, Sunny." Asshole. <laughs> and Tubbs is like, yep. <laughs> Shaking his head across the way, like, mm. After Gina storms out, Sonny says to Tubbs, like, I'm concerned for her. I want to make sure she doesn't get hurt. 
And Tubbs says, she's a cop. It's not your call. You're, you're not Castillo. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> so mind your own business. <laughs> you did it for one day. Okay. Yeah. You're a Castillo for one day. No. It doesn't mean you get to do it all the time. I think we should just put it on the table. He's not worried yes. about it because she's a, she can't do her job. He's worried about it because it's Gina and he still has feelings for Gina. If it was Trudy, he wouldn't be running off to go make sure she was okay. It's because it's Gina and he's got nah. a thing for Gina still. Uh-uh. He still does. I, I think he would just feel better if there was a man on the case. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm telling you, the whole like him going over there to her house before the date and kissing her. Yes. Let's talk about that in a few <laughs> scenes here. We got a couple little ones that we have to get through. But yes, I want to talk about that. So the duo take off. They go to Cook's house. The duo show up. The house is open. They stalk around and Tubbs finds Cook dead in the pool with his throat slit and a plate of pasta on his lap, which says, I didn't get at the time. It says al dente. <laughs> Sonny says he's definitely not al dente. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get the pasta thing until now. Then I realized like, oh, cook pasta, and then Frank. And like, okay, I get it. Why that was there. But it was really bad pasta. So sauce was just broccoli sprinkled on top of some fettuccine. It's a piss poor representation <laughs> of pasta. Come on He didn't now. get yes. a chance to eat it, though. It wasn't touched. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a shame. I mean, the guy's a pasta man, and you kill him, and you don't even honor him with with decent pasta. <laughs> exactly. At the and once again, there was no one surveilling the dead guy. Nope. You know, the one that they wanted to get the records from to well, you know I mean, go after Frank. It's not like they were trying to protect him or anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs and Crockett clearly aren't trying hard to catch Frank. I get it. They were told to let Gina do the undercover th- part of the investigation, but they're not really contributing anything on top of that. At the precinct, Castillo is having a conversation with the state attorney, Alice, and two federal agents who are saying that they've been following him since Cleveland. They have a lot of dirt on him. They need a little bit more, and they want Vice's help to sharpen their charges and get someone on the inside with Frank. And Castillo says, we already got someone on the inside. And like, well, can we use her for information? Like, yes, but as long as you share it with Vice, we want to find out if there's anything else that's going on. Uh, But as long as you keep me in the loop as everything is happening, you can use Gina. Yes. So now we get to Gina's. That night, Gina's going to go out on a date with Frank. Sonny shows up. He knocks on the door and she's getting ready. She looks nice, but she's getting ready to go on a date with a with a person who's supposed to be a millionaire mobster, right? And Sonny, yeah. what's going on, bud? And he, start, he starts out with, they'll think a man should be handling this. But then he kind of forgets about that real quick and starts doing the whole kissing her neck. Like when they used to hook up on steakouts back in the day. <laughs> it just makes me wonder like isn't he married to like Catherine or katie <laughs> or something <laughs> and that's what i was telling dominic the whole time i'm like okay see so he's a married man and he's a married man that just shows up at her house and he talks about how good she looks in her dress he's like oh that's some nice evening attire you have then he like turns her around and hugs her and like touches her and kisses her on the neck and then tell her, like, I'm so sorry. I, I I just worried about you. And I'm telling you, he has feelings for her. That's why he was, like, that's why he went over there. He did not go over there to apologize or to be like, I know you can do this and give her a pep talk. He went over there because he has feelings for her and he wanted to be. They kiss yeah. each other on the lips. Yeah. At the end of that, they kiss each other on the lips. And she's like, oh, I got to go on my date. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, I got to go call my wife. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> tell her I'm a, I'm a sleazeball. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two things I want to point out here. One is. This comes off as they are still hooking up. Occasionally, there's something still going on between them. And so that's why there's still this attachment. Now, you could say like, oh, it's because they're cops and they work together. It's like, no, no, no. This definitely comes off as occasionally, Sonny and Gina might find each other sleeping in the same bed. Mysteriously. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Two, this is also a challenge that Vice has gone through when you have different writers and directors through seasons that they all interpret what Sonny and Gina's relationship should be. And so we get this weird mix of sometimes they come off like this and they're like still together. They still have feelings for each other. And sometimes they come off as a repulsed by each other. Yeah. And it's because of the mixed up writers and directors who have their own opinion about what, especially because it was Dick, it's Dick Wolf now, but before uh, Dick Wolf started, we had Michael Mann. And so there was this different perception on what they should be. I agree. To your first point, we have seen evidence that Gina will tie one on a little too heavy at times. Yeah, that's true. And she, when she goes out with Frank tonight, things fire out of control for her really fast. And this, like, like what you were saying, Melissa, is that it gets out of control and you're like, damn it, Sonny was right. But she also recognizes that it was getting out of control. So really fast, we see Frank and 
he's talking to his wide guard, Billy, which is confusing because it's Frank Stallone, Frank, Frank. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can't think of anything with uh-huh. Frank in the show. <laughs> he says, she's good. Go for it. There's nothing concerned about that. Also, Cook's been taken care of. So now we go to the restaurant and Gina is really laying it on with Frank. And at this point, I still think she's doing her job, but she's drinking a lot. She's partying too much. They're getting really yeah. close to each other. They're drinking champagne and time one on. And it's weird because is it like a wise guy thing where everyone sits in the same booth? Six couples stuffed into that booth with them. They even pulled the table out, let everyone sit down, and then push the table back in. They like to be close. We for a first date, like you'd think, be alone, but I don't a little know, bit I of guess separation. Being, yeah, you know, not bring you know your your twelve best buds. <laughs> and there should have been a warning right in the very beginning because the first thing that someone talks to Frank about is like, hey, did you hear about Cook? And there should have been a reminder to Gina, like, oh, yeah, that's right. These people are all mobster murderers. Like, I need to be as careful as possible tonight. I definitely feel like she's not careful at all with the way that she is working this case. Like, she's not taking the this, this seriousness of what he can do to her mm-hmm. at all into account. So mm-hmm. then on the limo ride back to Frank's, there's lots of giggling, more champagne. They're making out in the back. It's really now got out of control. And when we get to Frank's house, we see the look on her face like, oh, shit, this, this has gotten to a point where I don't know how to stop it now. And then when Frank comes back over, they do some more dancing. There's some more making out. There's some more alcohol. And then Frank lunges at her. And this is when she really starts to push back. Like, no, you have to stop. This is not what I want. But Frank doesn't. And so there's this weird place that Gina finds herself in. And she talks about it later, which at, at the next scene in the precinct. But she realized she was in over her head when it was too late. And this isn't the first time that she's... Uh, found herself in this position undercover where she has gone too far put herself in a situation that ended exactly the same as this exactly and the only thing i would say that's the difference here is that in give a little take a little he was calling her bluff because she was supposed to be a prostitute so he's like if you're a prostitute then you need to come up here upstairs to sleep with me and so he had his suspicions that she was a cop and she backed he backed her into a corner and used it against her. Like, if you're really a hooker, you would really go do this. Where Frank still doesn't know who Gina is, but Gina found herself in the same scenario where she got herself backed into a corner. Yeah, I think if she thought... She said no, first of all. Mm -hmm. She said no, that she didn't... No, 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 no. And then at that point, I think she just thought if she took it too far with the no that she was going to mess up the case. Mm -hmm. So then she was, you know, there she was. She was in that position. She very clearly does say no, though. Like, there's no yeah, there's no yeah, secret there no. that she's not like, oh, okay, I did it, but I didn't want to. She says no. It does go too far for her, and she tries to stop it, but she can't give away that she's a cop. In, yeah. In a conversation, which was a uh, little, Judy says, "We're just women. We make bad choices." I thought that was a weird. I thought that was weird too, but I think to- I think she was trying to say like, "We're just like." I was taking it as like, "We're just human. Like, we make mistakes. We do things." We are are cops, but we're also women. So you could say the same thing about Sonny and Tubbs, right? Like we're cops first, but we're we're still men. We make stupid mistakes. We do things like sleep with hookers. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Really fast before we get to that scene, because I think that's where we all want to talk about. Just really fast the next day, Moss is out getting flowers. The feds come up and like accost him on the street for laundering money. Frank specifically points out one of them and says, hey, make sure you contact me if you need any flowers. So like, hey, by the way, like this guy's going to be dirty because he specifically called this guy out so now at the precinct it's the next day the whole vice team is there talking to gina and she's saying what happened the night before what information she was able to get not necessarily what happened but what information she was able to get and as melissa you said everyone's got their judgy faces on everyone's judging they're all like when she's talking they're like oh look at her she's hung over because she's like clearly hung over she's holding her head like ow my head hurts and then uh when they get further in she said something about cook the information about cook and is, it, is it more cruel just pretending like she didn't sleep with them because like she makes the the Dad says, well, how did you come by this information? She she doesn't say anything. And there's this uh-huh moment, like everyone's eyes kind of roll. Yeah, that, exactly. That's what and I was then saying. And that's that when it gets thing. all quiet and like all of the men excuse themselves out of the room. But dad doesn't say anything, which just strikes me as kind of weird for him. 
But I guess it is him because he's like, oh, whatever. He doesn't want to talk about her sex life. <laughs> he doesn't. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> she says he definitely killed Cook. There's a brewing war between Mosca and Jimmy Roth. I'll talk about banks and cities. As you mentioned, Castillo's like, hey, how'd you get this information? She doesn't answer. Then everyone leaves. Sonny hangs out for just a second to give his extra judgy before he leaves the room. Then Trudy stays. And that's yeah. where we have this conversation that you guys were talking about. And Gina says, I can't believe what I've done. But in retrospect, it's like it also seems an awful lot like you didn't do anything wrong. She's supposed to be undercover. And so she was just doing what she thought she had to do for the case. And then when she was in too deep, then realized like, well, the, my only way out of here is I could pull a badge. But I can't do that. Yeah. No, I don't think she did it. But to be honest with you, I don't think she did anything wrong. I think she did what she was supposed to do. She took it as far as she could go to get the information. She said no. So that should have been, he's a pig. So he shouldn't have continued. And, and she said no. And, and she mm-hmm. like in her head, okay, I'm a cop. I can't do this. Like maybe she had too much to drink, mm-hmm. but that's, you can't say that because then that's like, yeah. then you're being like a victim blamer. <laughs> like, well, you shouldn't have went out in that short skirt or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. He should, the bottom line is he should have stopped. She said no. Yeah. Several times. So he should have stopped, but he didn't. Yeah. It's just interesting conversation that she's having with, with Trudy because it almost seems like there's a part of that conversation with, where she's almost saying, I was getting into it. Like I was enjoying being out with him. I was enjoying the date. Like I was getting into it myself. That is an interesting wrinkle here is that she does absolutely admit to that. That she tells Trudy, like when I'm around him, I don't know what it is. I can't control myself when I'm around him. And so when she was there with him, and like she knew she like she knows i'm not supposed to drink this much i'm on duty i'm not supposed to let yeah that certain part. things happen because i'm here to get information but she's telling trudy i couldn't stop myself there's something about him that yeah. made me vulnerable to that's him. true but also like that's being isn't that like just being human that you can like someone's you can like somebody's company and mm-hmm. like having drinks with them and like having dinner and that was all fine and dandy but that doesn't mean you want to sleep with them yeah oh yeah that just means that you had fun with them hopefully he'll wear flowers and that'll make it all all yeah, go I know, away right? it'll all be better excuse me for that that date rape i did here's some tulips <laughs> a lot of them <laughs> yeah lots of them <laughs> at the spaghetti factory frank is there with one of those feds you know the one that he pointed at and he asked how come you aren't giving me the information that there was more investigations coming from the feds? What do I even pay you for? And they have a him with it's a actually, around his neck attached to a forklift. It's a brilliant idea, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's a brilliant negotiating tactic. I mean, just look at scared guy's face. Like, he knows <laughs> one little pull of the lever, you know, and he's gone. I just, I feel like Frank Stallone might have been better as the interrogator than than the other Frank. I feel like Stallone might hit slightly harder. <laughs> I was really intrigued when I saw the forecast. Like, are they going to lift him up or are they going to crush him? <laughs> what are they going to do with him? Are they going to put him in a box? <laughs> <laughs> Frank asks, who's the mole? He's like, I don't know. All I know is that someone from Vice has in- infiltrated your community is close to you and it's something that's happened recently last couple of days he said yeah. at gina's frank calls her house is covered in flowers he apologizes for last night and says i acted incorrectly but when i'm around you i just can't control myself this sounds really familiar like <laughs> yeah. what might be put into court to pre- yep to by a lawyer and a judge would say they're right i don't want to throw your future away but you do have to register as a sex offender. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just love how he does it. Okay, hey, did you get the flowers? Okay, well, I'm sorry about the rape. Uh, when can we do it again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's pretty much what he said. She's like, I don't know if I want to see you. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I feel about you. <laughs> He's like, ah, don't worry about it. I'm going to send someone over come pick you up. I'm going to make it up to you tonight. It'll be better than last time, I swear, baby. <laughs> when he hangs up the phone, Billy says, man, I don't like you and how close you are with Gina. You're giving her way too much information. You had some loose lips last night when you were in the limo talking about what 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 you were up to. So then that night at the restaurant, Frank is there with Gina. Gina's now obviously doesn't want to be around him at all anymore, but she's still doing her job. And he keeps saying, I'm going to make up to you. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. They had dinner with Jimmy Raw. Why are they all sitting in the booth again? <laughs> I thought booth, this was I supposed think. to be different this time. <laughs> <laughs> After dinner is over, Jimmy Roth leaves in a car and then Frank goes to get in his own car and then there's a drive-by. So after the drive-by, 
Gina, Frank, and Billy are all fine. Well, I don't know who the other person is because Billy's the one that actually shot. Yeah. But they're all fine. The poor Mater D at the restaurant got shot. Yeah, I mean, don't <laughs> talk about him at all, though. <laughs> so when the duo show up and there's the police crime scene that they're investigating, Sonny's like, I'm going to go talk to Gina. And Tubbs like, you're an idiot. Like, you're going to out her as a police officer. Who knows how she's going to respond and what they're going to think when you show up there and stuff. Don't blow her cover. And Sonny's like, whatever. He goes over and he goes, talks to Frank. And Frank says, you should be talking to Roth. He's the one that set the shooting up. I don't know why you're here talking to me. But it's all just because Sonny wants to see Gina. And yeah, when they pretty go, much. And when we go to the precinct the next day. He's, the first he's thing also got to do the guy thing. The first thing that Castillo says the next day when Sonny comes in, is like, you could have blown her cover. <laughs> <laughs> we, and, and so like, I tried to tell him. <laughs> Everyone's talking. They haven't seen Gina in 10 hours. She hasn't checked <laughs> We've in counted all. the hours down. <laughs> so now they're going to run off. They're going to go talk to Roth, and they're going to go find Gina. At Frank's, he's talking to Billy. They're the ones that staged the drive-by. So they wanted it to look like Roth was the one that put the hit. And then they... And Billy says, hey, I also tried to take out the cop at the same time. And Frank's like, yeah, the bullets got a little close to me, too. Mm -hmm. So it was all a setup. Gina is basically screwed. She gets busted red handed because she's inside making a phone call to Vice to say, I think it's Roth is the one that killed Cook, even though it's wrong. But she's biting on the fake out because they're like, well, Roth is the one that's trying to murder everyone, not Frank. Frank hears it. He picks up the phone, too, and listens on the other line and hears that it's Gina talking to Vice. So now she is caught she's dead done. in the water. Yeah, she's done. <laughs> yes. When she hangs up the phone after she realizes she got caught, we flash to the station and see Switek severely confused. <laughs> Unfortunately, Zwitek is unable to use his words to get help for Gina, <laughs> but luckily, <laughs> other people in the department figure this out <laughs> and run to Gina's aid, while Zwitek is still confused by the phone. <laughs> he doesn't understand how it works, okay? <laughs> Did you notice that he never said anything about the phone call? No, like, that's it. We never hear about the phone call. <laughs> the duo are at Miami-Dade County Jail talking to Jimmy Roth. And Roth's like, listen, I know you all are stupid, but I'm not. And I know that Gina, the broad, as he calls her, it's is a cop. a cop. And Frank isn't an idiot either. Not like you guys. Because when he says that, Sonny's like, what cop? And he's like, Gina. <laughs> yeah, you dumbass. <laughs> Even I know uh, that, and Frank knows that. And so then yeah, Sonny... <laughs> you know, the cop that Frank's trying to bang. <laughs> <laughs> and so the so Sonny runs out, they get in the car, then they're going to fly over to Frank's place to go save Gina. They're like, oh no, she's been made, and call it into the station like, She's and been made. That's why Tick's like, she's been made? Oh. What? <laughs> That's what that meant? It, it, it's even better, too, because you get the uh, driving fast montage. And mind you, like they're, it's suppo they're supposed to be like five minutes away. So you get this long montage, montage of them speeding through the town in the Ferrari. And the whole time I'm thinking they missed their turn or they got the wrong Thomas Guide number because we flash to Frank and Gina. We get this long scene of them talking. Frank basically forces Gina to go with them. They get in the car, they drive off, and then like a half hour later, the uh, <laughs> Crockett and Tubbs come barreling in, and like everyone's looking at them like, like, what? They haven't been here for like an hour. Like they, they've been gone for a long. <laughs> My favorite part about when Tubbs and Crockett get there is that they got Billy held up against the stove. They're trying to, quote unquote, negotiate with him. And when he won't talk, Sonny grabs him and says, like, let's put you next to the stove. Maybe a little fire will get you to talk. They turn on the fire, like shoots up like eight feet tall, right? <laughs> and they grab Billy uh -huh. and turn to throw him on there. And one of the stove doors. The oven door, yeah. Yeah, one of the oven doors falls off. And both Sonny and Frank Stone look at it like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it clearly wasn't supposed to happen. It's like a blooper. It just falls off like a hit. they hit it at the right moment. It just fell down. They're both like, whatever. Just keep going with it. <laughs> He eventually says, oh, they're at the, at the spaghetti factory. So here we go to the last scene of the episode. At the spaghetti factory, Gina's so talking, Gina to talking to Frank. They just learned how spaghetti was made. Um, <laughs> it was a great tour. <laughs> 
Gina says, you knew about me the whole time. Frank says, no, not until after. Wink. Wink, wink. The duo bust in. <laughs> Frank takes Gina as a hostage and then throws her down and runs off. He jumps on a conveyor belt and rides it up to the top. When he gets to the top, he's positioned where he can see down the conveyor belt. And Sonny, like a moron, <laughs> is riding up the conveyor belt, too. Now, he can't see where he's going, but Frank can see him. Tubbs and Gina go running upstairs to go see if they can catch Frank another way. Gina comes up to the stairs, has her gun out. She sees Frank. Frank is positioned to shoot Sonny square in the face. This is the death of Sonny Crockett that's going to happen here. She yells, Frank, with her gun out. He looks at her. There's a long pause. He doesn't move. And then she fires, hits him, causes his body to be replaced by a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> he turns uh, the plastic instantly <laughs> which falls on the conveyor belt sashes his head he's dead Sonny and Tubbs both come running over they see that he's dead and they look at Gina like how could you well okay wait a minute though let's get this straight he didn't point the gun at her no he didn't he didn't nobody who's gonna kill Sonny but she but she didn't give him oh, a chance no, to do she, anything she just said it freeze and he froze and then she shot him she didn't even say freeze yeah, she saying. said frank frank yeah that's what i'm saying she never said drop your gun she never said anything and he never reacted to her he just looked at her and she shot him so uh, i mean be, be, beyond that she has gone all the way with two criminals while on the job she has killed them both via firing a gun okay gina's a black widow <laughs> She's killed three. She, she, Liam she, Neeson. Liam Neeson, too. She slept yeah. with Liam Neeson, and then when he turned out to be still this Irish, how, <laughs> she this, shot him. This is how she gets her kicks. I'm telling you. She's doing this on purpose. You guys are missing the biggest point of all. The biggest thing in this whole episode. With Cook and Frank dead, who's going to run the pause factory? <laughs> Who gets the spaghetti? <laughs> It's not sanitary, though, now. He's died in there. No, Sonny and Tubbs touched it all. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs with his sweaty-ass feet. Like a little Rubbing. kid. <laughs> and then it freeze frames on Gina, and the episode's over. It's actually a fairly short ending compared to what everything Frank has put them through. So Gina's mm -hmm. able to make quick work, and, and I'm going to break from you two and say, good job, Gina. <laughs> Nice, nice work. He was I mean, a danger. He was going to kill Sonny. He was a jerk, too. I mean, I don't, no love loss there. He was a douchebag, like I said. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't feel bad she killed the bad guy. I'm just saying that there's a clear pattern here, and Gina has a problem. <laughs> I think, John, you are right, though, is that the key thing that we're not focusing on is what's going to happen to the pasta factory. Someone going to come in I, tomorrow? I'm legitimately and... worried. I think, I think Billy gets it. <laughs> Well, that's this week's episode. Let's go talk about this week's music because we're back on the music train. No more problems with the music segment where they actually, you know, put music in the episode. So let's go break down this week's music. All right, John, we're back on a normal schedule. Everything's fine. Everyone breathe a sigh of relief. It was only one week that we didn't have music. We're back to normal. What do you got for us this week? So, I have one band that you guys haven't heard me talk about and two people you have. Let's start out with the band I haven't talked about. The song Sweetest Smile by Black. Black is not a band, actually. Black is a person. Black <laughs> is the stage name for English singer-songwriter Colin Verncombe. He pretty much started out on the punk rock scene, but achieved mainstream success uh, mostly in the pop in the late 80s. His most notable hit was the international hit, Wonderful Life, that he released in 1987. So to give you a little history, uh, he had released several albums by 1985 under the stage name Black, but he'd struggled to gain traction. It wasn't until he recorded Wonderful Life on a small record company called Ugly Man Records <laughs> uh, that he was able to get noticed by A&M Records, who would launch his international career. And they would do that by just re relaunching Wonderful Life over and over again. <laughs> At first, Vern Combe found it hard to top Wonderful Life. He actually released a song called Everything Coming Up Roses, and it just completely flopped. And uh, Sweetest Smile was actually kind of his first hit 
after a wonderful life and he would release a re-release wonderful life in 87 before selling two million copies of his record comedy in 88 and his record black in 91 after that, he would at least one more album before taking a hiatus from 93 to 99. Uh, when he would come back from his hiatus, he would start by releasing music under Colin Verncombe. Uh, and then when that wouldn't work, he would go back to releasing music under Black. And he actually just, he's continued releasing music through the 2000s and the 2000 teens, all the way until he was involved in a traffic accident on January 10th, 2016, near Cork Airport in Ireland. Uh, it was a pretty bad accident. He had to be placed in a medically induced coma, and about two weeks later, he would die of his injuries. Damn, we have in the music segment... There has been so many people that have died because of cars or motorcycles. Someone should really step in on cars and motorcycles. They're the real killers. You can only make a car like a driverless car, you know, <laughs> that drives you. Yeah, this just takes the people out of the equation. It takes you around, takes the best route. You only have to think about it. Then you can be strapped into like one of those race car seats. Oh, yeah. I'd be totally down with that. In an unrelated note. Out here in Arizona, Google's going to start their own self-driving taxi service. So everybody watch out. <laughs> Our next song is Dearest Game by Tommy Shaw. Tommy Shaw first appeared in the episode Glades with his song Gun uh, Girls with Guns. If Tommy Shaw's name sounds familiar, that's because he is Tommy Shaw of the band Styx. Mmm, okay, that's why. He was born in Alabama. He started in music and bands in Chicago as part of one band called The Smoke Ring, and then later MS Funk. So after MS Funk disbanded, he was invited to join Styx uh, when the band needed a, guitar a guitarist on short notice for a major tour coming up. The band's fame would skyrocket and he would become a permanent member of the band and actually start contributing. He, he was a contributor on, this, on songs Foolin' Yourself, Renegade, which is probably the best one, Blue Collar Man, uh, and he actually sang the lead on... Too much time on my hands, which is probably my second favorite stick song. <laughs> but after their power ballad Babe hit number one, keyboardist and lead singer Dennis DeYoung had to push the band in the mainstream and make more theatrical performances. More theatrical than sticks? I didn't think that could be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're talking full on like Lion King costumes and <laughs> they would stay together for about two more albums before Shaw would leave and go solo. He would be involved with the super group Damn Yankees and pretty much release solo stuff and do other stuff in music. Nothing that will ever measure to good old sticks. It's all Dennis DeYoung's fault. Why did he have to <laughs> insist on makeup and costumes? Can't you see? Just trying to have fun. We had too much time on our hands. <laughs> <laughs> so our last song is Winners and Losers by Iggy Pop. Iggy Pop also, well, Iggy Pop, born James Newell Osterberg Jr., uh, <laughs> also known as the godfather of punk. His first appearance, we talked about him with his song Real Wild Child in the episode Kill Shot. Iggy Pop is the legendary lead singer of the Stooges. He's most notably known for his song Seek and Destroy, I Want to Be Your Dog, Lust for Life, Passenger, and Real Wild Child, which was our previously featured song. So I'm just going to kind of highlight things with him because we've we already talked about him back in Kill Shot. So just going to kind of highlight. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2010. He played in a bunch of high school bands. One of them was called the Iguanas, mm -hmm. which is what led to hit the adaption of his stage name. Iggy. He played in a lot of blues bands as a drummer before dropping out of the University of Michigan, moving to Chicago, and that's when the Stooges would come about. From 68 to 74, he with the Stooges. They would eventually disband because of Iggy's growing heroin addiction. That's when Iggy Pop's solo career would begin, and well, that's when David Bowie would basically save Iggy's career because the two of them would become best pals, they would hang out, try and get clean together, 
Bowie and Iggy would write music together, like they wrote the songs China Girl, Tonight, and Sister Midnight together. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. They're good old pals. So, and, and they even did some tours in Europe and Berlin. And because Ziggy just kept making music, he even, uh, I mean, all the way until the 2000s, he's still making music and still a part of, of the music scene. So some stuff that you might not know, Iggy Pop was featured in soundtracks for such great movies like Crocodile Dundee 2, <laughs> uh, Train Spotting, Lockstock, and Smoking Barrels. And two smoking barrels, the movie Repo Man, and a bunch of crap I've never seen. <laughs> uh, he was an actor in The Color of Money, just like one of our guest stars, Paul Herman. He was also in The Crow, City of Angels. He was in the Rugrats movie. Did you know Iggy <laughs> Pop was in the Rugrats movie? <laughs> He was in Coffee and Cigarettes. He was also in the in the movie Snow Day. So if you're you know part of that Rugrats crowd, you'll probably enjoy <laughs> Snow Day. He was also in the movie Dead Man with Johnny Depp. Apparently, him and Johnny Depp are pretty close friends too. That's probably not surprising, right? Those two. <laughs> and he acted in the movie Tank Girl. Mm. Actually, half decent. This is my favorite part, though. The TV shows that he's appeared in: Adventures of Pete and Pete. <laughs> and Star Trek Deep Space Nine. <laughs> Man, he's got a serious Nickelodeon connection. Yeah, he really up in <laughs> Which is strange, because yes. why would anyone from Nickelodeon know who he was like yeah. at the time, like being on their show? Does he even have kids? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and your last bit of trivia, in the movie Velvet, uh, Velvet Goldmine, Ewan McGregor portrays Kurt Wilde, a character which was loosely based on Iggy Pop, which is probably why I've never heard that movie. I, I've seen that movie. It makes a lot of sense that that's supposed to be based off of him. There's a lot of drugs consumed in that movie. Mm. Here's all I know is that if you want to get ahead in music, Iggy Pop is someone that you should talk to. He can help you out with that. He's worked with David Bowie. He's very successful on his own, too, not just for the band, but his solo stuff, too. So Dan Swayze. <laughs> <laughs> Don Swayze, sorry. Don, yeah. Don, Don Swayze and um, John Travolta's brother. Joey. Joey. Joey Travolta. Get a hold Joey. of Iggy Pop. How did you, how'd you forget about Joey Travolta? <laughs> he looks just like John Travolta. I looked at him when he was young. It's creepy. He does. All right. So, John, as always with the music, I mean, you started off strong with the music and mentioning Don Swayze. <laughs> so... <laughs> but the music comes, and of course, we're always caught off guard with what comes up in that section. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode, because I think me and Melissa may not see eye to eye on this episode. Let's uh -oh. go give our final thoughts on this one. All right, I'm going to start this week with my final thoughts. This episode, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> if we hadn't seen it before, we have seen basically this exact story. And although it's nice to get a closure on a really horrendous bad guy in Frank Mosca and to get it in the same season, by the way, I mean, Lombard's still out there. We still don't know what happened with Lombard. Mm -hmm. We still don't know what happened with Tubbs' baby. We don't know a lot of things about a lot of different criminals. We don't know what ended up happening with them. So it is nice to get in the, like the closing on the Frank Mosca story. I just don't think we needed this story. And my biggest problem with this one is is that this, they just write the same episode for Gina again and again and again. And we just got done with the Trudy episode where they're like so condescending to her. And then with the Gina one, who's supposed to be the strong woman character, like I'm not just a police officer, but I'm a, a I'm a Sonny Crockett level police officer. Like I can go bust these things on my own. It's really frustrating to have this story. And then have her not be able to do it and rely on s some other people to come in and give her a hand. I'm also getting really tired of the judgy looks that the men give the ladies when the ladies do something. Like, I can't believe you did that. Let's go back in time and see all the crap you two have done. You two? <laughs> even Stan. Uh -huh. Yeah, you never do nothing right. How are you? you eat hot dogs and screw everything up. <laughs> So I, I guess what I'm saying is like if last week, Melissa, you said last week was the world's okayest episode of Miami Vice, <laughs> this one seems like the most unnecessary episode of Miami Vice. So there's nothing new here. We ticked all the boxes that Miami Vice does. We even did the exact same story that they've done before. So, John, what are your final thoughts? 
I think I'm right there with you as far as, like, we've seen this before. Like, this is not deja vu. It was so frustrating about it. Sonny is so condescending at the very beginning that I just want Gina to prove him wrong. And it makes it so much worse when it goes... A- when it just goes down that exact same path. I really wanted Gina to prove him wrong so that she could rub it in his face. Like, I'm just as good of a cop as you. I, I think you're right. I think it's the most unnecessary episode of, of Vice. Either that, or I could be completely... Maybe I was right. I was joking, but maybe I was right. Maybe she really is a predator. Maybe she is a black <laughs> widow. I don't know. I was really rooting for her at the beginning, and then by the end, it was like, like we already saw this episode. Anything this episode did was it brought to light that there is a Joey Travolta and a Don Swayze out there. (laughs) I had no idea those people existed. Um, Now I want to get that show back together. Let's get them in the house with Frank Stallone. Let's do this. (laughs) Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I'm very disappointed in this episode. I guess I should say right away that I'm disappointed in a lot of the writing they do for the women. It's very disappointing. They could be doing so many different angles with them other than them just being hookers or being the bait of sexual predators, basically. That's what they do for them. And mm-hmm. you're right. It's it's like lazy writing that they made this exact same story. And it it's even weirder now that you say that they weren't the same writers for the directors. So did they not look back and see what they've done for her that she falls in is either she falls in love with people and they're the wrong people or she breaks the rules like what she did when she thought that person might be her father or, you know, whatever that he knew her mother and all that. He bro- she broke the rules for him. He was a murderer. And she let him go. So I feel like they are very con- they, they the writers are condescending to the women. That's what I feel like. And that's why it comes off that way in the show. And it might be a sign of the times that that's what they're trying to say. Maybe it was a statement they're making that. Being a woman cop was hard because there's a double standard. But everything they do is judged, and the boys don't get judged for what they do. Even Stan, who screws everything up, and he's still like, no, he's okay. We don't we don't judge him for that. He's just Stan. <laughs> Other than that, it did kind of bug me at the end where she shot him, and it didn't feel like she needed to shoot him. But, I mean, I get it. She, she was gonna, He was going to shoot Sonny. That, that was going to happen. It just felt like there should have been, like, he should have pointed the gun at her or something, made it more clear that that was going to happen. And there's obviously some gray area with the, the the way she feels and what happened and what was going on and why she did what she did. But the bottom line is that they made Gina out to be like she couldn't handle herself. And I don't believe that that's the way it should be. I don't think that's what that that doesn't seem like anything like her character would do. But they keep writing it that way. Mm-hmm. So disappointment. I mean, I'm glad they finished it out and you got to see. And I'm definitely glad he's gone because he was a, his character was a very evil man. So he needed to die. I, and it bothered me a little bit because I'm pretty sure he plays in the Hunger Games. He's like the uh, talk show host guy in the Hunger Game. And if Google him, because he looks ridiculous in it. You know, um, it's hard picturing him a tough guy. Knowing that, like, like having that pic. Sorry, Stan. And that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the other ways that you can contact us too Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, S- Snapchat. I want to say, I don't know. We got pretty much anything and everywhere. You know how to find us. Go hey, with well, the heat. instant message. <laughs> <laughs> Our GeoCity site is still running. You can get us on <laughs> Yahoo Messenger. <laughs> on that website, there's also a tab for support. We would love your support. Support step number one, email us, contact us. Let us know what you think of this episode. Step number two, go to your podcaster or podcatcher platform of choice and leave a review. Just give us the highest rating. No matter what it is, just give us the highest rating that it is. Five plums. Go for it. Give them all. <laughs> but don't write a review. No one ever reads the reviews. Instead of writing a review, write in there what you would say to Don Swayze and <laughs> Joey Travolta. What kind of show should they make together? Come up with a show pitch that we should have for Don Swayze and Joey Travolta. I think there's still an opportunity here. John has hit on something. There's still an opportunity. Let's get him in a room. Let's pitch them some ideas. Only, only if we can get D- Johnson to join in. <laughs> Support step number three, check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. We'd love your support. Go check out what our future plans are of the show and see what else we want to work on. So we encourage you to go check that out. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal. 
Thank you.